Uh, hi, I'm uh, Javier Ramirez, and uh, that's my Twitter handle in case you want to complain to the organization about the quality of the talk or whatever. And uh, I'm one of the founders of Tiawaki, which is a company, I'll tell you a bit later, one minute, what we do. Uh, and we use Redis for a lot of things, and I want to tell you in this talk how you can use Redis. But uh, before that, I'm going to tell you about uh, this, this couple, Clark Kent and Louis Lane. Because, you know, I, I like, one thing I like in the Superman movie is like, you know, Clark Kent, he's always around, and he's in love with Louis Lane, but Louis Lane, she's like, uh, she doesn't really care, because, you know, he's just uh, all the time, they're friends, he's available, he's doing his job, but it's like, that's it, he, it's, it's nothing else. And then suddenly, she realizes that he's like amazing, Superman, and she's like totally in love with the guy. And that happened to me too. Uh, with Redis. With Redis, I was Louis Lane. Because, because, bear with here, <laughs> because, you know, when I started using Redis, it was by chance. I had to install I don't know what, and Redis was a dependency. APT get uh, Redis, it got installed, it was always working. It was always there in the background. So whenever something was crashing, it wasn't its fault. So Redis was always there for me. He was kind of my friend, but I didn't notice that Redis has superpowers. And when I noticed, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, and I realized, this thing is amazing. I really have to, you know, how couldn't I see how powerful this thing is? And the first thing is like, for, you know, for realizing that Redis has superpowers, uh, first thing is you have to forget some things that you take for granted, like for example, uh, if you are like me, you have been educated thinking people can't fly, okay? And if you are like me, you've been educated thinking when you have a performance stolen in your system, it's always the database, always. So that's not the case with Redis. They, Redis is a data store, and in this laptop, which is not even an Apple, I'm getting... <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a startup, I don't have money, it's, you know, you are lucky I have a laptop and not a phone. Anyway, actually, I have a phone. Uh, this was not prepared, but I have a phone. Amazing, piece of technology. So yeah, with, uh, I have keyboard. So yeah, I have half a million inserts a second in this laptop. Uh, in one of our servers, which is uh, $5 a month, in euros is like nothing, uh, we are getting like... A quarter million inserts, it's not yet inserts, it's like, you know, we are actually sending the request to the server, so it's like the round trip, and we are getting like, you know, quarter million inserts, so the database, when you're using Redis, data store is not the bottleneck. So what is Redis? This talk is not about what is Redis, it's how you can use it. But anyway, I have like a two minutes intro. Redis is like an open source, which means you should be contributing to it. Uh, it's an open source uh, key value store. And if you are like me a few years ago, I thought key value store, you have a key, you have a value, that's it. You have plenty of those, but it's much more. Because in Redis, the values actually are data types. So a value can be not just uh, you know, like a value, like a number or something. You can have a structures there. I'll tell you a bit later. Uh, the leader of the project is uh, Salvatore. He's from Sicily. And yeah, there are some contributors, and uh, you probably should contribute too. Writing documentation is also contributing, so maybe you can start that. The project is written in C, so if C is what you like, you can work there. If not, there are clients for a lot of languages, basically for every language, so you can work on the clients. Anyway, contribute. So, one thing I like about Redis is like Redis has the superpower to making me think. Making me think is really a superpower, I can tell you that. So, <laughs> I mean, you don't know me, but if you know me, you know that actually that's kind of a lie. But it makes my partner in the company think. Because when you have a relational database, just put data there, and somehow later you will make like an extraordinary query, and data will appear magically. And behind the scenes, you don't care what you are doing. The query is just working. You have like indexes and a lot of things. So in Redis, as in any other NoSQL store, before inserting data, you have to think how you are going to read that data. So depending how you are going to use the data, you should be storing in one way or a different way. And I like that because I feel more like an engineer, which I kind of am, but not really. But the thing is, you know, it feels more like you are doing something like, oh yeah, I have power, you are the machine, I am the master. 
and then usually it's the other way around. Anyway, so in Redis, you have to think how you are going to store the data, uh, thinking of how you are going to retrieve it later. So you can store uh, strings, like in, in, any other key value. You can store hashes, like, you know, hash tables. You can store lists, like arrays, or sets, which are quite interesting. Sort, sorted sets, which are like sets, but sorted by the field. Uh, and something quite cool, which is called a hyperlock lock, which is a data structure in which with, I'm not entirely sure, but it's like 12, case of 12, 12 kilobytes of memory, you can store how many unique elements you have in billions of uh, recalls. For example, if you have a log and you, uh, you want to know how many people, how many different IP addresses have been hitting your log in that day, and you had like 400 million hits, in only 12 kilobytes of memory, you can have the total of how, how many unique hits you have there. That's an hyperlock lock. You can have that in Redis too. So it's quite amazing because it's key value, but the values are data structures. And then you, when you start using it, it's like, well, it's amazing, but how you can use it? Just a bit later. The basic commands are really basic. Set data, get data, delete data, expire things, increment, decrement, boring. There are much cooler commands, like, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, you can read later at home, you know? So much cooler commands. You can set a value only if the value already exists. If it doesn't exist, don't do anything. You can do interesting things with that, I'll tell you later. Blocking pop means, OK, read a value from this list, but if there is no value, just block until there is one. So you have a queue. You know, yes, OK, you keep reading until you have something. That's quite amazing. Uh, Blocking pop from one list and atomically pushing to other list, just in case something goes wrong, I don't want to lose the data. So it has those kind of interesting patterns that when you use it, it's like, wow. Ah, uh, get and set with the strings, but uh, only on subsets, so you can have time series. Or do intersection of, of, uh, of sets. Or a really simple publish and subscribe mechanism that you can use for making a chat in six lines of code. With these six lines of code, you can have a chat supporting in one server of five dollars, probably ten thousand concurrent users. This is the code. That's it. It's in Ruby, but you know it could be in any language. So what we are doing here is okay. Start ready. Uh, get the connection to Redis. Subscribe to this topic, and every time I get a message, just write in the standard output the message, and from a different place you publish. Everybody that, ha that has subscribed here is going to get the message. You can have 10,000 concurrent clients, one single server. If you need more, you can have a cluster. It's going to work. Since I've code, chat working. Whoa, whoa. Uh, things are atomic in Redis. It means that if you have an application in which a system, in which you have like different uh, processes, like I have something written in Ruby, something written in Node.js, something in Scala, something in whatever, and you want to keep uh, and you, are got, you want to share a structure with them, like for example having a counter global for all the application, you don't have to care about that. Because you know, all the operations are going to be atomic, so you can be concurrently writing for different places, it's going to work. So if you are doing Java, Scala, whatever, and you have threads, it's quite easy. You have structures in your process for managing that. But you have like, separate processes, and you have to concurrently be sure that this is going to work. You know, with Redis, you don't have to think about that. It's like quite, quite fast. If uh, atomic operations are not enough, you can script with Lua. So you send a, a Lua script to Redis, and everything that you execute in that Lua script is going to be run atomically. So that's also quite interesting. Uh, the trick here is this is really fast, and this is quite powerful, because everything is in memory all the time. Uh, so, does it mean that if the server goes down, I'm going to lose all the data? No, it doesn't mean that. I mean, it means if you, if you install Redis, because that's something you hear a lot. No, it's in memory, data store. What happens if the server, yeah, if you install Redis with the default configuration and the server goes down, you are going to lose a few minutes of data. That's the way it is. But if you read the configuration file, and you uncomment the line where it says, hey, I really want to persist the data like every time. No? You can get like real persistence and not losing data. For having performance numbers, like you know, in the, in the range I showed you before, you might still lose half a second of data. If you want not to lose anything at all, you can configure this for that. It's not that fast in that, in that case scenario. But you know, it's up to you. You can just manage that. 
And if you want to have a cluster, different machines, because you know you need a lot of memory, yeah, you can do that too. You can serve by hand, you can use a proxy for, to serve for you, or you can use the Redis cluster, which at the moment is in beta, is in the, since yesterday, is in the beta 3.0.0.5. So basically it's working, unless you want to make uh, hot changes while the cluster is, uh, is running, like adding or removing servers. You do that at the moment, it's going to crash. But if you are not going to do that, it's already production ready, and it should be like totally production ready in the next few weeks, probably. So that's for the intro to Redis. The thing I want to tell you in this talk is how can you use it? Uh, what is being used for in other places? Twitter, I guess everybody here uses Twitter. Yeah, who knows Twitter? Everybody, cool. Uh, you'll see later why I'm doing the stupid thing of who uses this. So Twitter, <laughs> every time you are pushing into Twitter, uh, every time you are, you are uh, sending a tweet or, or reading a tweet, Redis is like one of the first stops. So when you read your, your timeline, all the tweets that you are reading, uh, they, are there, they are there because, you know, they are stored in a way, they are stored in, uh, on, on Redis. For every active user, Redis is keeping the last uh, 800 tweets. Uh, and, you know, they have uh, very interesting numbers, like... Uh, 5,000 words per second, and these data are old, are like one year old, so probably now they are getting more insights per second, that's the average. Uh, last year in August, I, they had what I believe it was like the highest peak on traffic, and the number is like, they have in one second, they have uh, 143,000 inserts in one second, which is like quite interesting. And they're using Redis for this. How they do it? Well, what they do, it, what they do is, when you write a, a, a tweet, the first thing, they have this graph DB. The, the flock DB is a graph database by Twitter. So if, you, if I have, I don't know, 25 followers, on the graph DB, it, you are going to see, OK, I have to send this tweet to 25 different users. Cool. So it's going to take the, not really the tweet itself, because it's going to be everything in memory. So it's going to keep only the ID of the tweet. So it's going to keep the ID of the tweet and the user ID and it's going to make 25 insertions, one per user. Katy Perry has 53 million users in Twitter. Every time Katy Perry says, I feel hungry today, Twitter is making 53 million inserts. Like that. If Lady Gaga says, hey, me too, let's go for a beer, it's like, whoa, no, don't do that, you're breaking the system, because you know, no, seriously, that's quite, that's quite bad. No, no. So, yeah. So if you know Lady Gaga, please tell her not to. Anyway, so the thing is, the tweet itself is in main cache. And the user information is in main cache. But the index of, you know, the mapping of users to, uh, to tweet ID, that's here. And in Twitter, they have this thing that uh, the longest it passed since Katy Perry says, I'm going for a bugger and someone can read it, it's five seconds. So it's quite performant. And this is an interesting approach. But I like the way SoundCloud fixed this same problem, because they took the opposite approach. Instead of every time you get an in, uh, a tweet inserting to all the timelines, they, they were doing that at the beginning, and it was like, uh, no. And they released this thing called Rossi. I think yesterday there was a talk about this, actually, in this same room. I couldn't, it was too full, I couldn't enter. So they release Rossi, and Rossi is something for managing your, uh, if you have Redis and you want to have time series, like a stream, in the activity stream, you can use Rossi. And what they do is the other thing. Rather than doing uh, the fun when you are writing, they do it when you are reading. So if a friend of you is posting something, that's it. It's a story on Redis and that's it. When you are going to read that, they are going to see all your friends, they are going to get all the information from your friends, they are going to make the stream, and at that moment is when they are composing the thing. So it's the opposite approach, and it's quite interesting. So, you know, same backend, different approaches, both are quite cool. If you need to build a stream today, uh, I will take a look at Rossi because probably you don't have to reinvent the wheel, it's already there, so you can try it. World of Warcraft, who here knows World of Warcraft? Yeah, you'll see later why I'm doing this. World of Warcraft, they also have uh, Redis. They don't really like to talk about how many servers, how many things they have, but uh, it's known 
because they don't like to tell these things, but you know, since uh, people know things, they have like uh, over a million users concurrently on only on the ASEAN version of the game. So for reading all the avatars from World of Warcraft, they are coming from Redis, which is also quite interesting. And it's another of the use cases. You have a lot of people doing things, you need something quite fast, just put it on Redis, and you know, you can go with that. Stack Overflow. Who here knows Stack Overflow? Yeah, I know, I know, this is getting old. Yeah, Stack Overflow. It's like, you know, <laughs> without these people and Google, I couldn't work, really, seriously. It's like, come on. So in Stack Overflow, you have a lot of different, uh, different uh, websites, like 50 different websites, like, you know, the Stack Exchange and a lot of things. And they have cache with Redis in three different levels. So they have a really local cache, which is like, we don't persist this. If the server goes down, we are losing that. But we are losing, yes, you know, session of the users, whatever. We don't care about that. It's like, yeah, in worst case scenario, you are logged out. That's fine. That's not really mission critical. They have second level of cache, which is the cache for a single site, like, for example, for Stack Overflow itself. And in this one, they are already uh, storing uh, information persistently. Every time you go to Stack Overflow and you see the list of the latest questions, hot topics, whatever, that's coming from Redis. And uh, they have the, uh, another global cache, which is the one which uh, works through all their sites. Messages for your user, user profile, that has another persistence, and that's also coming from Redis. Pinterest, who hears, is the last one, who hears no Pinterest? Yeah, I know. Pinterest is this place that I don't recommend you to visit if we are close to Valentine's or the, no, the day of the mom, something like that, because you know, you can, it's an overdose of pink and sugar and hearts and flowers and seriously. But anyway, it's quite cute. And one thing that they're doing in Pinterest is like, you are following pins, which are like, you know, topics or something, and you are following users, and other users are following pins too, and you want to know which pins you are following implicitly, explicitly, blah, blah. So what they are doing, how they are doing this, they could have been using a graph database, maybe. I don't know. But they are doing, uh, they're using sorted sets. So they have all the, uh, all the pins of the user and all the followers. They're in one set. And then for knowing what they have to uh, show to you, they just do intersections between different sets. That's quite fast, and it works. How fast is this? Well, who here knows you porn? I knew that. Yeah, yeah, and me neither. I, I, had to, I had to go to this site only for doing research for the presentation. <laughs> Being a speaker is, is not an easy job, I can tell you. I'm still trying to forget some things. But the thing about YouPorn is that it's really porn for developers. Because these people are having, in one day, they have like 100 million page views per day. 100 million page views per day. How this is working? Well, it wasn't working fine previously. They have this operation working with, uh, I believe it was Perl. Yeah, they have Perl and MySQL, and they were, they were having a trolling with MySQL. They were hitting the limits. It was like, no, this is too much. So they moved to PHP and Redis. And the interesting thing is right now, when you go to YouPorn, when, when some pervert goes to YouPorn, not you, of course, no, but when someone from other communities, they go to YouPorn, uh, all the information you see there, except for the videos, is coming from Redis. They don't have a database anymore. Everything is just on Redis. So what happens if the server goes down? Nothing. I mean, everything is still there. So yeah, it, it works quite uh, And the interesting thing is, if in, in YouPorn you have these categories, let's say uh, categories in general. So if you want to see all the videos about flowers and ponies, <laughs> I, I haven't tried that search yet, but <laughs> the moment I get internet, I'm going to do that. So you want to get the videos about flowers and ponies in YouPorn. What they are doing, basically, is like having set intersections. So this is actually what they are doing. It's like, OK, we have the different filters. They apply all the filters. When they have everything, they make like a temporary uh, storage of the results, and they paginate over that temporary store, and that's how you are seeing the pagination of the videos of all the flowers and ponies that you have in your porn, which is quite interesting. It's like, oh, you know, you, you have, having data structures makes for interesting things. Uh, actually, they had an interesting thing. They, when they put Redis, they had to change the network cards because the bottleneck was the network, not the data store. 
So Redis was being much more performant than the network itself, and they had to change those because it was like, okay, we, we, we need to change it. Snapchat, which is a slightly, you know, so Snapchat, which is this thing for sending like second pictures, they also have, they have uh, Redis, they have 200, uh, over 200 master, over 200 slaves. Uh, they are running on the Google App Engine, and they are processing over 400 million messages a day. And that's working fine for them also with, uh, with Redis. GitHub. In GitHub, they are using Redis for a lot of things. Absolutely a lot of things. But uh, one thing they are doing is every time you go to GitHub and you, uh, and you are asking for a repository, Git is not really thought for having... Git is not performant. So basically, they have a lot of uh, different uh, hard disk. And when you go for, to a repository, they need to map in which physically, in which hard disk they have the repository. So for doing that matching, that every time that you go in the website, on the command line, whatever, the first point of call is Redis. It's like, okay, in which machine do I have a Git for this repository? And after that, what they are doing is like RPC. If you are writing a command, they are executing that command remotely in that machine and sending the result back. So yeah, they are using Redis for that. They are using it for many other things, but that's one of the use cases they are, they are uh, using. HipChat, which is an interesting chat, uh, chat room. So what they are doing here is when you connect to HipChat, the last 20 or 50, I don't remember, messages of the room, they are stored in Redis. So when you connect, they don't need to go to the database. You connect, you have some scroll back already. You have like maybe 50 messages. Usually people, when they connect to the chat room, they don't go you know, on the scroll back uh, more than 50 messages. So they can skip totally, for most of the users, they skip database. So they are just showing the messages the, the way they generate. So they have like this really small intermediate cache for every chat room, and it's working for them. And the other thing is they have XMPP, but in XMPP, uh, by default, if you have users in one XMPP server and users in another XMPP server, they can talk to each other. So they are using the publish and subscribe uh, mechanism of Redis for making this happen. So they can have, you know, XMPP across different servers, and they are using Redis for exchanging messages between one and the other, and from the point of view of the user, that's transparent. It's like, wow, Redis is really amazing. It has superpowers, yes. But sometimes things go wrong, and you have to be careful with that too. For example, Instagram. Instagram made this claim a few months ago in the, in the web. It's like, yeah, we moved from Redis to Cassandra, and we were saving 75% on servers. 75% of servers on Instagram must be like the budget for Portugal for one year. I don't know. It's like, uh, I, I know Spanish, what can I say? And, and the thing is, you know, you know, it's a huge amount of money. But the thing is, if there is any Portuguese in the room, it was just a joke. <laughs> a funny one. Anyway, the thing is in Redis, everything is in memory all the time. Okay, so this means you need a lot of memory. This means you should store only small things, like a lot of them, but small ones. Like in Twitter, we saw they're storing only the IDs for, uh, on Redis, nothing else. So in Instagram, they were storing things like, if you see a picture of a pony and you don't like it because, you know, who likes ponies? And you want to report it, you report abuse, and they were storing that abuse on Redis. So it's like, you don't need to have that like, no, highly available, like really fast. And they were using it for a lot of things. And yeah, they realized, you know, if we store these things on disk, and Cassandra is amazing for storing, making a lot of inserts and a few reads, that's uh, the use case for Cassandra. So yeah, they moved from that, they could put like cheap disk rather than expensive RAM, and that was a huge, you know, amount of uh, saving for them. So you need to know there are a lot of, of servers with superpowers. Redis is just one. But you have, you have Cassandra, you have Hadoop, you have whatever. So you need to choose wisely and you know, choose the one which is better for your use case. Not just use Redis for everything. I've done that, you don't want to do that. Thank you. Uh, second thing, Twilio. They did the right thing. In Twilio, they, they knew what they were doing. So they have this master server and they have a lot of slaves. Twilio is a company it's like a Skype, but you know, modern for doing like a, a voice over IP and really interesting things. So they were using for the, they charge you for using the, the calls. So for this uh, invoicing mechanism, 
they had Redis. And they had this uh, master server and a lot of different slaves. And they had this problem in which the network partition, so the server couldn't talk to the, to the slaves. When the network came back, all the slaves tried to communicate at the same time with the server. And they hadn't thought of that. And actually, at that time, Redis had like not the best behavior in the world. It was changed after this bug. And now it's a bit better. It should support that better. But the thing is, the master was starting to, to lag behind. And they decide, OK, let's go into stop the master and promote one of the slaves. But on, in Redis, you can do interesting things. Like if you connect to the console, you can change the configuration on the fly without, you know, without restarting. But that configuration is in memory, unless you do save. So apparently, someone in Twilio once had changed the configuration in the master, and they forgot to persist to disk. So when they stopped and they restarted, it started with a different configuration. It was hell. So the clients couldn't be charged. It, it was quite difficult, the, the, the situation. So you have to take the time to master your superpowers. You need to know what you are doing. It's not just put, it, you put Redis and it works, and it's, all, was, it's going to work always. It's quite robust, but it's going, to, it's going to do what you are telling it to do. Anyway, don't be too hard on yourself. Salvatore San Filippo, the creator of Redis, was storing his blog on Redis, and he forgot that he hadn't configured persistence, and it had been running for over one year, and one day his provider, Restarted the server, his cloud provider, for some reason, up upgrade the operating system, whatever. He lost all the blog posts. And this is the guy who created Redis. Anyway, it was quite easy. He went to Google search, retrieved everything from the cache, put it a new Redis, and the, the, the blog is back already. But the thing is, everybody fails. Don't be too hard on yourself. I've, I've told you about a lot of things about Redis and big people using it. But uh, the truth is, before you are too big, you can already use Redis for a lot of things. And I'm going to tell you in these last uh, few minutes how we are using it in uh, my company. So how we are using this? My company in 30 seconds. I'm not going to be too spammy. It's a service for developers to communicate with each other. So you have, you have teams, and you have uh, your activity, and you have your activity stream. Uh, and you can have information coming from the tool or coming from different places, like Bitbucket, Pivotal Tracker, Webhooks, whatever. So, one of the uses we are doing, of course, is for having the stream and the recent activity is always coming from Redis. But we are using it for, much, um, for many other things. For example, at the beginning when we were starting using Redis, we were using it only for background processing. So every time we had to do something like uh, upload the picture of a user and we have to process that picture, it was you know, back to Redis, to a queue, and from there we will process it. Uh, you have to send an email back to the queue and process it. But we were sending to the queue only the things that the, we wanted to process on the background. When we realized, when we learned how Redis works, we decided to send to the queue absolutely everything which is happening in the system. If you are seeing the page of a user, if you are doing, I don't know, uh, updating your profile, even if I'm not going to do anything with that update on the background, uh, still, I'm sending that item to the queue. Because this is so fast, it's for free. But at the moment, we have the whole system is totally uh, instrumented. So if I decide in the future, when you make a change in your profile, I would like to send on the background an email to tell you, hey, someone has changed the profile. Maybe it wasn't you, for example. I can do that without, taking, without changing my code. I only have to you know, make a background job, read that from the queue. So at the moment, we are sending everything to the queue, and we are dis discarding most of the activities. Why? Because it's for free. It's going to stay in the queue for a fraction of a second. You know, we read the, this, like, this message. Oh, we don't want it. Discard it. So that's it. And it's quite fast. No one is realizing about that. But we can separate into service quite easily. We have already separated a service because it was instrumented, and it was quite easy to do. So it was the first thing, abusing the system. Second thing, of course, intermediate cache. You know, sometimes you need to cache things. So we are using main cache for a lot of things, but uh, in main cache, you have only key values. As in Redis, you have uh, data structures. So when you need to cache relationship between users, something like that, that usually it will imply to make like a join on the database, 
most of the joins that we usually do for getting only one piece of information, for example, if I, has a, if I have a link and I have to get information from the user, for getting only the username, I'm not going to go to the database for you now to the user table for getting that. I'm storing that relationship into Redis, and that's it. So intermediate caching is another of the use cases we, we are having. Uh, we use Lua for scripting. Like, for example, uh, in Redis, you can expire uh, single keys. So if I have a, a key, I don't know, uh, global user counter, I can just expire it. I expire the user counter after five minutes. But if I have a hash table in Redis, I can't expire individual items inside the hash table. By using Lua, we can do that. So we have one thing which is like silencing users. So when you say, oh, I don't want this user, to, I don't want to see any message from this user in the, in the next two hours. So after two hours, what we are doing is using Lua, we are just you know, removing that item from the, from the hash. And the thing is, this is not supported on Redis, like that command. But you can write your own commands without having, you can extend Redis in C if you want, writing your commands in C. I don't like that. But you can write your commands in Lua. And it's not as performant, but it's performant enough. So yeah, we are, we are using it for that, for example. Uh, counters. In our system, we have a global counter. So every chain in the system has you know, a new uh, sequence. And we have different languages and different processes in the system. So you know, the problem of having a counter across different things, with this is really easy. You just, you know, you just uh, point everyone to the same Redis, increment, decrement, and you are sure there's not going to be collision, never. And if you combine counters with expiration, you have a really, really easy way of doing quotas. For example, APA usage quota, you put the counter of, uh, OK, this user has one hit of the API, expire in one minute, for example. You are increasing. So if within that minute you get over the limit, you are going to respond, hey, you are about the quota, you have to wait. And when the minute is going to pass, it's going to expire automatically. So you know, making, combining different things, you can do really interesting things, like in two lines of code. Of course, having a temporary data, like, uh, well, this is actually what I was telling you right now. But uh, something which is sometimes interesting, uh, you need to know which keys you have in your data store. And in other, in other uh, key value stores, like in main cache, you can't ask the server which keys you have a store. And if you can, it's quite slow. So in Redis, they have now a scan command, which you can actually ask the server which keys you have in the, in the storage without making it slow, without blocking. So that's also quite powerful because you know, in, in other systems, you want to do that. Uh, you need to have like secondary index, something like that. Here, you don't need the index. And the last interesting use case we have, since Redis is really, really, really uh, simple to implement the protocol, you have clients in any language. So one thing we are doing, we have Nginx as the uh, web server. From Nginx, you can use Lua. So we are using, for the API quota and a few other things, we are actually uh, checking the quota use of the users without going to the application server. We do it directly on the web server. So the web server speaks Lua, Lua speaks to Redis. If for that token of the OAuth authentication, if for the token we see the user is over the quota, the web server is going to tell directly to the user, hey, try later. So your, your application layer, which is usually more expensive, bigger machines, is busy with other things. You know, you can just forget, you can forget about that. So you can delegate things here. Actually, there are some companies that are using only, there is one framework now called OpenResty, which is Lua on top of Nginx. And there are some companies moving to OpenResty for you know, making uh, simple web applications. And they are using this pattern, OpenResty plus Redis for the applications. So to summarize, Redis is more powerful than it seems at the beginning. It's uh, really, really fast. I mean, depends on your definition of fast, but it's uh, quite fast. Uh, documentation is quite amazing, but if you want, you can improve it because it's open source, and there are some things that could be improved. But really, you have like interesting things there. Uh, everything is in memory, and you can think of that as you know having data structures set between different projects. You can use it as a data store, as a simple uh, public subscribe mechanism, intermediate cache or just uh, as a queue. And uh, 
it can be used in really big systems like internet scale and in really small systems like, you know, two developers doing a, an application. And yeah, you should probably use it a lot more. That's what I have. And now I expect you to have a lot of questions and uh, I will try to answer. Thank you. This is for my mom, so smile. <laughs> I'll, I'll smile. Don't, don't, don't overdo it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for this talk. It's uh, interesting. So we're using uh, Redis pretty much as you indicated you started out. So it's running in the background, actually taking care of uh, buffering log messages between uh, our ap application service and Elasticsearch uh, with some log stash in between. Uh, you mentioned uh, clustering uh, yes. is coming up. So could you talk a bit more about that and, and explain what, what's going to happen? Yeah, clustering basically in the context of Redis, that's an interesting question because it's documented, but kind of dispersed. If you want to have like the best documentation, there are two really good sources. One is the Redis mailing list, and the other is the blog of Salvatore. Uh, he, he has specified the cluster, but the cluster basically is, uh, Redis has everything in memory, so when you get like over a few gigabytes of memory, servers start to be more expensive. So you want to have, you know, different machines. So the Redis cluster, transparently, you can have different machines. It's going to do the sharding for you, transparently, from the, from the client point of view. If one of the machines goes down, it's going to promote a, a different machine, the one that, well, if it goes down, or if you, or if you have a network partition, it's going to uh, make, a, it has a consensus algorithm, so it's going to choose which of the slaves is in better shape. It's going to promote it like as the master of the cluster. So you, you told to a single point, but you know, and uh, from your point of view, everything is working as usual, but uh, it, that, that's going to work. And uh, when you have cluster, there are a few operations that are not allowed. Right. Uh, in the past, every operation was, was multi-key. If you have like Lua script, for example, or there is like a special multi-command on, uh, on, on Redis. So you have an operation going to different keys, and you were sharding. Uh, Redis wouldn't let you do that, because since you can have different keys on different uh, shards of the, of the cluster, it wouldn't be optimal. But now you have a special syntax for the keys. So if you need to operate on multiple keys, on atomic operations in a cluster, you can use like a prefix on the, on the keys, and everything sharing the same prefix, it's with brackets, like a special syntax, it's going to go to the same shard, no matter what. Mm. So if you are operating across multiple keys, even if you're in cluster, you can still do it if you are you know, a bit careful about that. And at the moment, yeah, that will be like the best option for running a Redis on different machines will be, will be the, the yeah. cluster. But so the, a distributed queue, for example, would, would work? Sorry? A distributed queue, that, that would work? Yeah, a pops up, it works. For example, if you use 2 proxy. Yeah. which is a, a good approach at the moment for uh, doing sharding of the keys, you can't use publish and subscribe. But on the, on the Redis cluster, you can. Cool. So every, everything you publish something is going to be uh, published to all the, all the subscribers in, in all the cluster. Thank you. you. Uh, another question here, please. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yes, maybe for the video it's better. Sorry. Thank you. Hey, um, yeah, you mentioned Twin Proxy, and uh, there's also Sentinel and Redis Cluster. Uh, so there are like three alternatives, more or less, I mean, for different use cases, but more or less they tackle the same problem with high, high availability, or less. Yeah. So um, do you think that Twin Proxy will be obsolete with Redis Cluster? And what do you think about Sentinel? Or, like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? There is, like, yeah. I mean, there's no best yes. practice mm -hmm. right Yeah, now. there are alternatives because Redis Cluster is still not official production version. So that's basically the, the thing. It's like uh, on Redis cluster, uh, at the moment it's like the Vita version. So it's not production, it's kind of production ready, but you know. So in the past, if you wanted to uh, have Redis on different machines, you had to either do the sharding of the keys yourself, which is fine, but you know, it's uh, error prone because if you have like a, a client in Ruby, a client on PHP, one in Node.js, you have to really make sure that the three clients are doing the, the sharding in the same way, the sharding of the keys. So that was one thing you had to be working on. So 
Uh, that was originally the only option you had. So Twitter released this 2M proxy, which is a proxy that can speak the main cache and the Redis protocol. So instead of having to start yourself, you can just speak to 2M proxy, and uh, you know it will start for you. But it won't allow you to do uh, to work on different keys or do key or do publish and subscribe. So if you want to have Sardin and you want to have publish and subscribe, you can't use 2M proxy. And up to now, Redis cluster is still not the official production version. So that's why there are like different alternatives. Because you know the alternative until now they were like limiting in a way or another. So when cluster is production ready, that should be really soon, that would be like the preferred uh, option. What about Sentinel? Oh, Sentinel. Yeah. Sentinel is a piece of uh, software that comes with Redis. Uh, it's for uh, sanity check. So Sentinel is the part which is checking if the servers are up and running. If they are not running, it's going to run the consensus algorithm for, you know, for making them, uh, for choosing like the new leader. But Sentinel is not really uh, how you distribute the keys. It's like how you manage when your servers are going down and which is the next server to go up. So it's just uh, Sentinel is like sanity check. And yeah, Sentinel is part of the Redis cluster is Sentinel. Yeah, one question here, please. I don't know if you have. First of all, thanks for, thanks for the most in, entertaining talk I had in this uh, session. Uh, you. Uh, you mentioned about uh, atomic counters and yes. Redis, right? What kind of guarantees do you get in a distributed environment regarding the atomicity part of it? Well, uh, basically, Redis is single thread. So that's it. I mean, it can do only one thing at a time. So if you are getting people uh, requests from different processes, it's going to process one request, then the next, then the next. So you can be sure that you can get the, the trolling of what if, uh, if you want to increment a counter. So the typical trolling of two requests at the same time, both are incrementing, and they were seeing the old value. So since, since Redis is single thread, there is no way that nothing else can happen as one operation is being processed. But, so. but you mentioned about like clusters and things like that, right? Yeah. You, oh, you, yeah, don't, yeah. you don't get any guarantees in that regard, right? Like if you have like, the yeah, value the, modified across multiple machines. Yeah, on the cluster now, uh, the weights model, you you can still be uh, sure that atomicity is going to be respected. If you are operating on the same keys, uh, you are going to get a, an error on the client, and the client should try. So yeah, on the cluster, it's a, it's a, it's also atomic, so you don't you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. If you have more questions, just uh, hit me later. <laughs>